Hello, my dear FMD friends. This is Dr. Rajiv Dhawan, your ENT faculty. So, June 4th, 2022 FMD examination. A lot of questions of ENT and many of them were expected. Let us discuss those questions one by one. The first one. 60-year-old man presented to OPD with unilateral, mild, recurrent epistaxis, hearing loss, headache, cough and difficulty in swallowing. On examination, patient has palpable cervical lymphadenopathy. Guys, many times discussed in the class also, you know, adult person with hearing loss, with cervical lymphadenopathy, you have to think about nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Because nasopharyngeal carcinoma is going to cause you stake into your blockage and that leads to hearing loss and it is conductive hearing loss. And the first and the commonest presentation of nasopharyngeal carcinoma is cervical lymphadenopathy or metastatic neck node. So, wonderful question. The answer of this question will be A, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Okay. Why there is a headache? Because patient would be having temporoparietal neuralgia due to fifth nerve involvement and cough, etc. feature due to vagus nerve involvement also. You know, nasopharyngeal carcinoma causes the cranial nerve involvement as well. Okay. So, the answer to this question is A, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Identify the x-ray given in the image. Now, this is a very, very expected question. It is water's view and the water's view is the most commonly done view for paranasal sinuses and people might say the mouth is open or the mouth is closed. Water's view is mostly done with open mouth. However, in any x-ray view, look at where, in any x-ray view, when the maxillary sinus is very clearly visible, then it has to be water's view. So, water's view, which is technically an occipitomental view, is the most commonly done view or the best x-ray view for the sinuses and it shows all sinuses except posterior ethmoid. So, the answer to this question is B, water's view. The answer is B, water's view. Okay. Next question. A diabetic patient presents in the OPD with pain in the nose and blackish discoloration of nose and cheek area. There is a lot of clues here. We discussed multiple times in the class. A diabetic patient with something black in the nose or around the nose would be definitely mucormycosis. The answer is A. Mucormycosis is generally seen in, you know, diabetic patient or COVID-19 patients or the HIV positive patients. Okay. So, black color is a wonderful clue for mucormycosis. Another question, they were very generous for this particular topic was that they asked that, okay, some people say it's a diabetic patient, some people say it was COVID-19 patient, but the presentation was same. The OPD presentation was nasal discharge was there and progressive blackish discoloration again. So, this is mucormycosis and in this question, they ask you the treatment of the choice or the medical therapy. Of course, it is amphotericin B is the answer, A. So, mucormycosis gave two questions. So, diabetes gave, you know, not just one, like two or three questions this time. So, two questions of mucormycosis only. So, we discussed multiple times in the class, you know, a diabetic patient or COVID-19 patient with something black in the nose or around the nose is mucormycosis and the drug of choice is liposomal amphotericin B. Another question of diabetes they gave. They were very generous this time and we discussed always in the class multiple number of times that, you know what, Diabetes can give two questions in ENT. One is mucormycosis and another one in old diabetic particularly, it will be malignant otitis externa. So, look at this question. 62-year-old diabetic male patient with severe pain in the ear and granulations in the exonotary canal and there is facial palsy also. It is definitely malignant otitis externa. Malignant otitis externa. And I think you would be remembering that multiple times in the session we talked about you know, the diabetes can give two questions in ENT. You know, the, the young diabetic patients would be having mucormycosis and old diabetic ear question will be malignant odorizona. And can you imagine this, you know, this kind of thing has given three questions in ENT. You know, one of the diagnosis of mucormycosis, one is amphotericin B, the drug of choice for mucormycosis and third, the diagnosis of malignant odorizona. Next question. I have told, always tell you the questions in the exam are of, you know, three different types. One which you know, one which you little bit partially know, but you have to derive it little bit. You have to go a little extra length to solve those questions. And look at this question. A 35-year-old patient presents with the complaint of vertigo on hearing loud sound. I remember in my notes this question, this particular word vertigo on hearing loud sound came in the topic of menius disease. Yes, 
He's written the Vertigon blowing of nose also, and I always tell in the class all that there'll be certain extra finding written in the real time paper, which is there visible over here right now. So this is the typical, you know, diagnosis will be Meniere's disease. The vertigo on hearing loud sound, if you remember, it's called Tullio's phenomenon. And Tullio's phenomenon can be seen in other disorders also, like perilymphatic fistulas, like superior canal Dyson syndrome. But in this question, they never gave those kind of rare diagnosis. They gave a more common diagnosis. And I'm sure my dear friend would be remembering that, that we discussed in the class, Meniere's patient can have vertigo on hearing loud sound, which is called Tullio's phenomenon. And the answer of this question will be Meniere's disease. Okay, fine. Now, next one. Again, we discuss it like beautifully. A lady has a hearing loss. She turns pregnant and the hearing loss increases. It's otosclerosis. Look at the beautiful question they made. A young woman with history of progressive moderate bilateral hearing loss. Bilateral hearing loss in a young female. Otosclerosis, which is aggravated during pregnancy. I think we discussed it multiple times. The lady has a hearing loss. The lady turns pregnant and the hearing loss increases. It is otosclerosis. And in this question, very smartly, they asked not a diagnosis, but the treatment plan for this patient. And we know it is going to be the, you know, tympanotomy with stepidotomy was the answer. Some people say this was the answer. Some people say the answer was tympanotomy. You open the middle ear plus stepidotomy. So this is the C is the correct answer. Some people say this was the choice. C was the answer. C. So it's a, it is a case of otosclerosis for sure. And I know treatment of otosclerosis has to be surgery. And name of surgery is stepidotomy. And that was there in the choice for sure. Okay, fine. This was a new question. Bone anchored hearing aid is a neat PG INSD topic. But you know, every time they give you one question or two question, which are little beyond, you know, like, you know, that's okay. Bone anchored hearing aid, where you anchor the hearing aid onto the bone with a screw like this, like you put a screw and you anchor the hearing aid onto that. Bone anchored hearing aid, what is the indication of that? It is actually a unilateral severe SNHL. Unilateral severe SNHL because bone anchored hearing aid is going to work through bone conduction and you know bone conduction directly stimulates cochlea. In unilateral severe SNHL, the conventional hearing aid would not be of much help. In that case, you put the screw and attach the hearing aid onto the screw via the bone conduction that sound will directly reach the cochlea. Whatever function of cochlea is left can be utilized by this. Bone anchored hearing aid has got other indications also like chronic discharging ear. A lot of pus is coming from the ear. You cannot use the normal hearing aid because the normal hearing aid will get spoiled within one day only because of the pus. So you put the hearing aid over here. So chronic discharging ear. The other indication will be anosia. You know anosia, absence of the pinna or external auditory canal atresia. The canal is blocked. In anosia or external auditory canal atresia, you cannot use the, the usual hearing aids because the canal is blocked, pinna is not there. So, the indication of bone anchored hearing aid are, you know, unilateral severe SNHL. In this question, the answer was sensory neural hearing loss. The second indication is the chronic discharging ear. The third indication is the anosia, I mean, absence of pinna. And fourth is congenital atresia of the external canal also. So, whatever, you know, question uh, I could derive from people, I know there will be certain corrections also in the statement, the choices. I do understand that. But whatever I could gather in the last two days, I am presenting over here. The answer to this question is A. So that's a bone anchored hearing aid with a screw. And this is a screw and on the screw, the hearing aid is anchored. Okay. Now, the beautiful question again. Which anatomical level is being depicted by the arrow given in the X-ray of the neck? Better? Now, I always tell in the class, certain question you know 100%. Certain question you have to go little extra mile to solve that question. Okay, remember type B question. So this is a typical type B question. Which anatomical level is being shown by the arrow in the given X-ray? Now let us count, but first of all, the X-ray, the cervical vertebra 1, 2, 3, 4. So it is between C3 and C4. This is the arrow over here. Okay. Now, is it at the lower border of thyroid cartilage, upper border of thyroid cartilage, or the level of the hyoid bone or the cricoid? Now, guys, always tell me, you know, remember multiple times discussed in the classes that larynx extend from C3 to C6. I hope you remember, the adult larynx is from C3 to C6. We discussed many times in the class, C3 to C6. It means that this arrow is at the level of, you know, C3, C4 vertebra, between C3 and C4, roughly at the level of C3. Can you tell me 
what is the first cartilage of the larynx? Thyroid cartilage. So larynx start from C3. Larynx means thyroid cartilage, upper border. Upper border of thyroid cartilage. So the answer to this question is B, upper border of thyroid cartilage. You always knew that larynx is from C3 to C6. And you always know from anatomy, larynx start from upper border of thyroid cartilage, goes up to cricoid cartilage. So cricoid is still the C6 level because cricoid is the end of the larynx, okay? The upper border of thyroid cartilage, which is the beginning of the larynx, and we know larynx is from C3 to C6. So the answer to this question has to be upper border of thyroid cartilage. Now, this is a beautiful question they ask. These kind of questions should be there. They are asked actually so that you are able to utilize your existing information and use the common sense to solve it. And I hope, I'm really very hopeful that majority of you would have attempted this question correctly. Because this is C3, okay, upper border of thyroid cartilage. It cannot be cricoid. Cricoid is C6, better. okay, fine. Again, we discussed multiple times the any, you know, blowout fracture of the orbit. So, rounded object like cricket ball or the golf ball hit the orbit and the patient develop the diplopia and the periorbital swelling or periorbital acamosis. So, which wall got fractured? I think everybody knows that whenever a rounded object hits the orbit, it causes blowout fracture of the orbit and that is the fracture of the floor of the orbit. Floor of the orbit or the inferior wall of the orbit. So, this is a typical question of blow out fracture of the orbit and in this case, I am sure you see the teardrop sign and they were very kind. They gave you another question in which they asked you, identify the fracture depicted in the image and my dear friends, you could see very clearly in this that there is teardrop sign or teardrop opacity on the CT scan. The answer is blow out fracture of the orbit. So, in this time, they have given you mucormycosis diagnosis, drug of choice of mucormycosis, then diagnosis of orbital floor fracture and the CT scan finding also. So, like very, you know, like I would say, very easy to do question work there, which we have discussed multiple times in the sessions as well. Now, again, patient presented in EN emergency department with respiratory difficulty, cough, steeple sign was found on the x-ray and I'm sure you remember steeple sign is a feature of acute laryngotracheobronchitis also called croup. Steeple sign means narrowing of subglottis. It's a feature of acute laryngotracheobronchitis or croup and if you remember this disease is caused by para-influenza virus. It's a viral infection but there's a possibility of secondary bacterial infection. So, in this case patient is having difficulty in breathing and the steeple sign is there. So, my priority of treatment, my treatment plan should include all what? You should give oxygen. You should give steroids for edema because edema is the main thing and you must give antibiotics to prevent secondary infection. So, whatever information I could gather from, you know, students, these four choices were there. Just giving only antibiotic would not work. It's not a primarily bacterial infection. It's a primarily viral infection. Why would you give antibiotic to prevent secondary bacterial infection? Okay, so simply giving oxygen would not be sufficient because steroids are very important in this because there is a lot of edema in the respiratory pathway. So, steroid would be required. What is steeple sign? It is narrowing of subglottis due to inflammatory edema. Okay, so steroid would be required. So, answer this question would be C. Okay, now again, glue ear has to be there in the paper. Better. A patient has mild hearing loss along with nasal obstruction. You know, nasal obstruction means adenoid hypertrophy. Whenever you are, there is a mass behind the nose, the ear can develop glue ear. You know? The otoscopic examination given in the finding, can you see beautiful air bubbles trapped in the glue? The answer to this question is otitis media with diffusion. In the last session we discussed, glue ear is also called as serous otitis media or secretory otitis media or otitis media with effusion also. I had put an audio also in the telegram that please do remember that glue ear is also called otitis media with effusion, also called as serous otitis media or secretory otitis media. Glue ear was a very popular topic, is a popular topic, expected topic. And they gave you one more question on the glue ear, which I could gather from students. They said a seven-year-old child comes to you with the complaint of snoring, mouth breathing. If you remember, a mouth breathing child is adenoid hypertrophy with hearing loss. You know, adenoid hypertrophy with hearing loss due to glue ear. The diagnosis of this patient is adenoid hypertrophy which causes the mouth breathing and hearing loss is due to glue ear. What is the best treatment plan for this patient will be adenoidectomy with grommet insertion. 
very very expected question and i think similar question was asked in the tnd also over there and this is a question people told that this question came like this so guys i do understand some choices some statement may vary from the real paper but in last two days whatever could gather i am just presenting over here okay so there is a disclaimer there some choices may be different from the real one but the main sense resembles this one actually this is the case of adenoid hypertrophy with glue ear which needs a surgery called adenoidectomy with the grommet insertion you know glue needs grommet okay fine and the last question was again type b question we always discuss in the class multiple number of time what is surgical emphysema surgical emphysema is air beneath the skin i hope you remember air beneath the skin and all they go one notch above it they say what is the cause of surgical emphysema i always used to tell in the class also that air leaks from the trachea and it collects below the skin collection of air below the skin after tracheostomy is called surgical emphysema so what is surgical emphysema it is the collection of air in the subcutaneous layer now they ask what is the cause of surgical emphysema i guys i think this is more of you know common sense that somebody has applied very tight sutures beta over there some tight sutures around tracheostomy side beta if you have loose suture air while air will get some leak you know to come out of the skin below the skin area so now you applied a very tight suture on the skin air will be trapped over there so the answer to this question is b tight suture around the tracheostomy side so what is surgical emphysema as discussed multiple time surgical emphysema is air in the subcutaneous plane and the cause of surgical emphysema will be tight suture on the skin so there were other question also which actually people are mentioning here and there they were asked but i couldn't really get the proper exact statement of the choices so whatever i could finalize as of now i'm presenting over here my heartfelt best wishes for your success in exam i'm sure you've done wonderfully well in the paper i i know paper 1 was difficult so guys but collectively we have to make 150 let's keep praying for ourselves let's keep praying for others we always feel that their paper was very tough every time we get this news paper was very tough paper 1 was tough i agree with that but collectively you know we have to make the score 150 and above and may you all pass please keep praying please stay you know relaxed don't create anxiety for the result right from now please pray for your fellow friends also because the only heartfelt wishes may everyone pass the fmg examination thank you very much keep learning